many of you guys are glad to be back in youth service? I can't tell you how excited I am personally. Uh, I don't know if you guys realize it or not, but it's been almost a whole year since we've had an organized youth service. So to be back, I'm just really, really, really glad to be here. Uh, this past year has taught us a lot, hasn't it? We've been through a lot. But you know, one thing that I've learned in this, in this time is not to take for granted the value of a moment. You know, just this, uh, a year ago, I never would have thought that it would have been a whole year before we had another youth service again. So tonight, understand that opportunities don't just come That's right. all the time. And understand tonight that we have an opportunity, so let's not take it for granted. Amen. Let's help our, our praise team tonight worship. And remember, what you put into this service is what you get out of it. So tonight, let's be intentional with our worship. Let's back them, and let's see what the Lord's going to do in this house tonight. Oh, yeah. 
master, I thank the Savior, because you heal my heart, you change my name, forever free, I'm not the same, I thank the master, I thank the Savior, I thank God. Somebody thank him, hallelujah.
praise singers and all that they've done. Have they not been excellent? I, got I am so proud of them that as they've come together and practiced. I know they came up here, what, Thursday? Practiced for nearly two hours to get this situated, to, to, to make sure they were good for this service tonight. And I am, I'm so thankful for the sacrifice Brother Monty, Sister Cass, and doing what they've done. You may be seated right now. Uh, I want to remind you guys of our youth camps coming up. How many of you guys are excited for camp? Come on now, how many of you guys are excited? I know my Moss Bluff crew is excited for camp. They're always there, looking forward to seeing them. As of right now, I don't have any other announcements other than camp. So you guys be looking forward to that. And in July, we will be going to the Texas Youth Conference taking place in Lufkin. How many of you guys are planning to go to that? That will be July, the last weekend of July. I believe, and that's going to be a good time since they didn't have NAYC. Uh, that's kind of been what everybody's going to now. So I'm looking forward to what God's going to do there. Uh, looking forward to spending that time with you all. Our singers are getting ready to sing one more song. So like I said before, you guys get behind them. Let's set the tone and let's set the move for what God's going to do in this place. And we're going to have good church tonight. Amen.
are powerful, God above it all. I believe in you, I believe in you. You do miracles, the impossible. I believe in you, I believe in you. You are powerful, God above it all. I believe in you, I believe in you. You do miracles, the impossible. I believe in you, I believe in you. You are powerful, God above it all. I believe in you. I believe in you, you do miracles, the impossible, I believe in you. here tonight that uh, came to join us and uh, we just want to welcome you and let you know that we are glad that you're here I believe God's going to do something in this place tonight and I, again I want to thank Brother Monty Sister Cassidy for all their hard work our media team for putting this together this lighting and everything they've come up here and they've prepared and uh, made this possible so would you guys give them and our praise singers a hand a lot of people that have to come together to make this stuff happen. I know, you know it's, it's easy to believe you just show up to church and these things just take place, but without the Brother Dan's and without the, the Brother Monty's and the people that make this possible, we couldn't do it. So I am so thankful for them. And uh, tonight, I'm going to be honest with you, I, as I was praying and, and seeking the Lord this week, I'm trying to figure out what I was going to say. Uh, I ran across this, this story in the Bible and it, it moved me and I, I questioned it because it's not something that you would typically hear in a youth service. 
and I, I couldn't understand why, but I trust what I feel tonight. I can't say that I'm confident in the message, but I trust what I feel tonight. So tonight, if you allow me to speak to you for the next few moments, I'm going to turn your attention to Mark chapter 4, starting with verse 35. And the scripture says, In the same day when the even was come, he saith unto them, Let us pass over into the other side. And when they had sent away the multitude, they took him even as he was in the ship. And there were also with him other little ships. And there arose a great storm of wind, and the waves beat into the ship, so that it was now full. And he was in the hinder part of the ship, asleep on a pillow. And they awake him and say unto him, Master, carest thou not that we perish? And he arose and rebuked the wind and said unto the sea, Peace, be still. And the wind ceased, and there was a great calm. And he said unto them, Why are ye so fearful? How is it that ye have no faith? And they have feared exceedingly and said one to another, What manner of man is this that even the wind and the sea obey him? Tonight I'm going to talk to you from the title, A Call to the Deep. A Call to the Deep. Let us pray right now. Lord, I love you. I thank you for the opportunity that we have to gather in this place today. I pray, Lord, that you would help me be able to speak this message, Lord, the way that you've given it to me. I pray that you would open our minds and our hearts, Lord, to be able to receive the word tonight, God. I pray, Lord, that we would leave this place, Lord, changed. I pray, God, that your word would speak to us tonight. I pray, Lord, that you would do the work here in this place. We're believing on you for great things tonight. We give you glory and honor for what you're about to do. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And you may be seated. So in this story, Jesus is teaching by the seaside. There was a large crowd of people gathered there to hear him speak because by this time, Jesus has gained quite a following. People are hearing of the man that is performing miracles and all of these amazing things, so he's probably verified on Twitter by now. He's getting to be pretty popular. So here he is, and he's preaching this conference at the beach, and it says that his disciples are there with him. They've been following and listening to his teachings, and they've been hanging out with him for a while now, so to them, this may have just felt like another church service. This may have just felt like another Sunday school lesson. Because they were familiar with him and they were used to being around him, it probably was a lot like how you guys are when I get up to speak at a, a Sunday school lesson. It's just Peyton up there saying things like he always does, you know? It's possible that they felt that way. But as Jesus is teaching, he is teaching and he's using parables. And you can tell by the way that he is teaching, Jesus is being a little more serious than usual. He's being intentional with his words. And you can tell this because at one point he stops and he says, He that hath ears to hear, let him hear. This isn't just a generic statement. This wasn't just something that he said just to say. He's telling people to listen. Take heed to what it is that I'm telling you. There was importance to what he was talking about. Every person, every age, I need you to hear this. Well, now the eyebrows are raised as he's got everybody's attention. Because for the disciples, they're probably not used to Jesus getting serious like that often. But as he goes to teach these parables, he's... He talks about the sower and how the sower went out to cast the seed. And it says that the sower went out to sow the seed. And the seed on the hard ground represents someone who is hardened by sin. He hears the word, but he doesn't understand the word. And Satan plucks the message away, keeping the heart dull and preventing the word from making an impression. Then he goes on to talk about the seed that falls on the stony ground. And the stony ground depicts a man who professes delight in the word. However, his heart is not changed when trouble arises. His so-called faith quickly disappears. Then he talks about the seed that falls among the thorns. This represents the one who seems to receive the word, but whose heart is full of riches, pleasures, and lusts. And the things of this world have taken up his time and attention away from the word. The one that's become consumed with the things. The one that's become obsessed with with the money and the things that the world has to offer. And he ends up taking his time away from the word to where he doesn't have time for it. 
but the seed that falls on good ground. The good ground portrays the one who hears, understands, and receives the word and then allows the word to accomplish its result in life. The man who represents the good ground is the only one who is truly saved. Then he follows the parable with the lamp on a stand, which to summarize, he is encouraging his followers to stand out and to not hide away. And he uses an example of the oil lamp, which is brought into the home to provide light so that it wasn't hidden under the bed, but on a lampstand where it could have the most impact. Because in order for the message to spread and develop, followers must proclaim and show their faith. He continues on with these parables that are linked together in meaning. And for the sake of time, I won't break down each one, but if you were to go back and study it, you see that he's teaching people not to just be inspired by the word, but how to, how to apply the word. He is investing in them. And you can tell through his words, he is preparing them for something. He's teaching them the importance of this world. Because in a world that is constantly changing, the only thing that we can bet on to remain the same is his word. Heaven and earth may pass away, but we know that his word will not pass away. You have to know the truth, and you have to understand that the truth does not change. However, it's human nature for us to change. For me and you, this world spins and we change with it. And we change all the time. Many times it's through our emotions and what we feel that dictates what we do and how we react. And this is a problem. Because from time to time in all of our lives, you will be put in situations to make decisions based off of what you feel and what you believe. There was a story of a man by the name of Carlos Hathcock. He fought in the Vietnam War. He was a Marine, that was, he was a sniper. And at that time, he was believed to be the greatest to ever do it amongst his peers. He had all the accolades to be considered a legend amongst the people he was around. And there was one particular mission that he went on. This was toward the end of his career. There was a, a mission that had come up, and it was a volunteer mission. And if you're not familiar with what a volunteer mission is, that means that they volunteer for you to do it because they don't expect for it to be a complete success. In other words, it's probably suicidal. So when this mission came about, he said, if people think I'm the best and I'm going to do the greatest thing that this, this movement has seen, if I'm going to be able to go do something that the others can't do to prove that I am the best, I've got to do something no one else is willing to do. So he volunteered himself for this mission. And he talks about how he was brought in and he was dropped in behind enemy lines, deep in enemy territory. And he has to get to this certain point and able to be able to execute this mission. He crawled on his side for nearly two miles through farmland. He was a one man against the whole army. They didn't expect that. So he crawled for nearly two miles on his side, trying his best to stay undetected. Through the farmland and through the environment, he said that it was unbelievable how rough the environment was. If you've ever been on a farm or a rice field or something of that nature, you know it's not, not easy ground to walk on. And he was crawling through it. And he said that the insects and the bugs and the, the, the creatures that would come out at night and the snakes were there every time. This mission took him four days and three nights. He never slept. He pursued this mission relentlessly for four days and for three nights. And he said, before I left, it was important that I knew why I was doing and who I was doing it for. I needed to know what it was in my mission. I needed to take that to heart because I had to know why I was going. Because I knew that there was going to be a time when I got there that it was going to get tough. When the exhaustion set in. When I didn't have any more food. When I was getting delirious because of the lack of sleep, I knew that there would come a time that I would question what I had committed to. But before I left that mission, I made a plan that I believed would succeed. But I had to make up in my mind that no matter how bad I felt, or how tired I got, or how bad the situation became, 
I couldn't give up on the plan that I made before I left. And I knew that as long as I didn't quit, I couldn't fail. You know, we're in a situation right now where the world tries to tell you how it is that you're supposed to feel. The world tries to dictate what it is that you are supposed to believe. And if you don't know what it is that you believe, they'll make up your mind for you. You have to know beyond a shadow of a doubt what this truth is. You have to know why it is that we do what we do. This isn't just something that we hear. This is something that we live. This is something that we have to take to heart. And now more than ever, it's important that each of you understand why you do it and what it is that you believe. Sometimes when we rely on feelings, we feel like things won't work out because our feelings are constantly up and down. The emotions, they, they come and they go and it's high and lows. But that's why we have to be in the word to know that regardless of whatever happens, we know that it's going to work out because that's what the word says. Sometimes we believe the enemy is going to overcome us, but we have to know that in the end we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. Jesus robed himself in flesh and walked the earth like us, so the enemy came against him and his feelings also. He knew what it was like to feel emotion. He knew what it was like to not be confident in everything. He knew what it was like to feel sad and to, to feel the worries like you do. But he didn't operate on who the devil said he was. Every time he was attacked with feelings, he replaced it with knowledge. He didn't operate on who the devil said he was. He operated on who he knew he was. That's why it's important to know who you are in God. Because there may be a time in your life where no one may know but you. But as long as you know, you'll never have to question it. And this is important because as you pursue God's will for your life, not everything makes sense. Not everything's going to add up. There's going to be times that you see things happen and you wonder why. There's going to be times that you see bad things happen in your life and you wonder why. And things that's not fair and, and you can't make sense of it. But I can assure you that everything that he does is for a purpose. The scripture says that Jesus expounded all things to his disciples while they were alone. How many times have you had a moment alone with God where he began to reveal to you some things? Maybe a time after a church service where he began to show something to you, reveal something to you that he wanted to do through you. I can recall the monumental moments in my life where God did that for me. Even in the broken, battered, what used to be sanctuary across the street, I can take you to the place that God first filled me with his spirit. I can take you to places on the Tioga campgrounds. I can take you to the exact pew where I first felt God calling me. I can take you to prayer rooms where I had undeniable experiences with God and he did things for me and only me that no one could ever take away from me. And these are the moments that made me. And I know there are some in here tonight, you've had those moments. You've had those undeniable moments where God did something for you in a way like only you could understand. And many times it's in those moments that God reveals to you what it is that he wants to do through you before he creates an opportunity for you to do it. After teaching the disciples, after they get done with the multitude on the seashore, he finishes teaching and he makes a statement, let us pass over to the other side. Jesus does everything with intention. So just the mere fact that he makes this statement means it's of some significance or importance because God didn't waste time. You could tell because he had just started teaching early in the day and he had told them these things and he's telling you, I need you to get a hold of this. And now he's saying, okay, I need you guys to come with me. We're going to go to the other side. Jesus has taught to them and he's revealed to them some things that would be essential for their future. They didn't understand, but this wouldn't just be a day on the beach in a boat ride. This was something more. This was a trip to more than, this was more than just a trip to a destination. It's a direction toward their destiny. He had showed them some things, he had taught them some things, he had instilled in them some things. And he says, now I need you to come with me because I'm going to show you some things and I'm going to take you somewhere you've never been before. Let us pass over to the other side. This phrase indicates that where you are presently is not where you will end up ultimately. He's saying, I'm taking you from where you are now and I'm going to bring you somewhere else. Somewhere that's waiting for you. There's some things over there. There's some people over there that are expecting you. But in order for them to get 
from where they were to the other side, they had to cross the water. And water gets deep. This was more than just hanging out with Jesus. He was calling his disciples to the deep. And earlier this week, I felt a parallel between in this story and where we are right now. When you look at the world and the condition it's in, it's not hard to see that things aren't the way that they used to be. And when you look at the craziness and all that's happened in the past year, I'm seeing things that are coming to pass now that were merely stories when I was a child. When you look at Israel and you see the things taking place in our nation, we are living in a time like we've never seen before. And because I know what the Bible says, I understand the responsibility that comes with being a part of this generation. I know there's a sense of urgency for this generation to not only be hearers of the word, but to learn to apply it. You guys have been brought up in church. Many of you have grown up in it from the time you were born. And God and, and, and the man of God in your life has instilled some things in you. He has preached to you. You've been taught what this truth is. You know what it is. There isn't anything in here. There aren't many Bible stories you hadn't already heard. You know what it's about. You've been given a foundation. You are, are, have been grounded in this. And with that, as long as you're a follower of Jesus... There's going to be a time where he wants to take you from a place where the word just inspires you to a place where you can apply the word. Some of you I know have felt the call of God on your life. There's some of you in here that have had those undeniable experiences where you felt God calling you to something deeper. Where you felt God calling you and moving you and urging you to something more. And this is a scary thing because what is it going to require of me? For God to call me to something deeper, what am I going to have to give up? What am I going to have to leave behind? What's going to take place when I get out there? How is it going to change me? What will the outcome be? The deep is the element of the unknown. And there are things in the deep that you cannot see or understand. And not Vinny ventured to the deep because there's risk there. There's a reason the shallow side of the pool is the most popular. Because the shallow side is comfortable. Because the shallow side is safe. Because that's where the crowd stays. That's where everybody else chooses to stay. To be called to the deep is to be called alone many times. And it's an honor. And it's the greatest privilege that God could call you to something deeper. But can I tell you tonight that when God calls to the deep, it's because you have to be exposed to deep things in order to operate in deep things. Because it's impossible to discover deep anointing with shallow commitment. And he's trying to teach the disciples in this moment, I need to be able to get you to operate in a way that nobody else can. And I'm going to have to expose you to some things. I'm going to have to take you to a place where you have to be able to trust me. I'm going to have to take you to some places where you can't touch anymore. Some places that aren't comfortable anymore. Because I want to bring out of you the greatness that it is that I put in you. And there's a responsibility on you guys tonight. There's some of you in here that have felt that call. And there's some people in here that are feeling that urge and you're feeling that pull. And you're scared. But can I tell you tonight that if you trust God. He's going to take you to some places you've never seen. He's going to take you to do some things you've never done before. He's going to do some things through this generation nobody else has ever experienced before. And it's on you. So the Bible says that they left the crowd behind. They got on the boat with Jesus to make this journey to the other side. A lot of times the hardest part's leaving the crowd. Because that requires us leaving a place of comfort. That requires of us having to stand out and live a little differently than everybody else. That may require me to leave some things behind that I didn't want to have to leave behind. But when the deep calls, it requires that out of us. It's easy to be inspired when you're in in AYC and there's 45,000 other young people that are all on fire for God and standing up and, and, and doing, doing the most and they're, they're all excited and everybody feels the energy. It's easy to accept it in that moment. It's easy to say, I want to do what God's called me to do in that moment. It's easy when you come to a church service like this and you're here with your friends and you can come up to the front and, and pray together and it's easy to be inspired then. But to truly say, I'm going to pursue what it is that God's called me to do, a lot of times your friends aren't there with you. A lot of times God calls you to do some things and not everybody can go. It requires a sacrifice. 
It requires you saying, I'm willing to step away from what it is that I'm used to to pursue who it is that you want me to be because I want to be everything that you want me to be. And whenever you make that decision and you make up in your mind that this is what you're going to do and you truly commit to it, this is what the disciples did and it says it wasn't long before a storm came. There's this idea that when we decide to follow the will of God, that everything's always just this great, wonderful journey and nothing bad happens. But if you follow His will, the reality of it is storms will come. I don't say that to discourage you. But I know that there are young people in here that hell's fighting every day. And if you're old enough to be attacked, you need to be old enough to know how to fight. Because the moment you make up in your mind to pursue destiny... The enemy now views you as a threat. The last thing the devil wants to see is you operating in your destiny because now you're hell's problem. So when you commit to God's will, don't be shocked when the storm comes. Don't be shocked when things in life get hard. Don't be shocked to be exposed to tough times. Because hell releases everything it can at you to stop you from becoming what God created you to be. That's why I believe this generation fights the world as hard as it does. Each and every day you walk outside, you're exposed to the darkness this world has to offer. And I'm not very old, but whenever I was young, we used to have to look for bad things if we were going to find it. But today, you don't have to in the technology. Anything and everything is available at your fingertips. Whatever it is you want to see, whatever it is you want to watch, it's there. And the entertainment of today does its very best to desensitize the minds of people in an effort to normalize the immorality and the wickedness of this world. And it's no accident because, believe it or not, the enemy knows what the Bible says too. I don't believe that you guys have to fight things other people didn't by accident. It's because the enemy knows who it is that God called you to be as well. God says you're a chosen generation, and hell knows that. God says that it would be this generation that sees the greatest revival this world's ever seen, and hell knows that. So each and every single day when you decide to get up and walk outside, he's coming for you, and hell takes no days off. Hell attacks you and tries so hard to convince you to believe something you're not. You have to know who you are and what you believe, because if you don't know, you can be, conceived, you can be convinced to believe anything. And if he can't destroy you, for the ones that's got their mind made up, hell knows that if he can't destroy you, he will do his best to delay you. He understands that before you were formed in the womb, God had a plan for your life. He knows that God created your life with an expected end. If you pursue it, there's nothing in the world the devil can do to stop you from accomplishing God's will in your life. So he has to attack you in a different way. If he can't kill your pursuit, He'll do his best to kill your time. And the only tragedy worse than knowing you didn't fulfill God's purpose for your life is knowing that you had the opportunity but ran out of time. Hell has no days off and the agenda is to steal, to kill, and to destroy. So if he can just throw a few distractions in your way to take your time, if he can just make you stay in a relationship you know you shouldn't be in a little bit longer, If he knows he can just do some things to to grab your attention, to keep you away from spending time in the Word, to keep you away from church, to keep you away from what what you know you should be doing, he still wins. He's still winning. That's why it's imperative to wake up every day and remind yourself of who you are and what you believe and to be intentional about what you do. You've got to start reminding yourself every day of your purpose and understanding that you are called, that you are chosen, and that you are favored. And hell has an agenda, so you've got to be about yours to say, I'm going to wake up and I'm going to pursue what it is that God has for me. I'm going to do what it is I know I need to do. I'm going to step away. I'm going to pursue. I'm going to be what it is that he called me to be because I know that if I don't, hell's get the people that are part of my generation. You have to be about it. Because when you make up in your mind to pursue God, you will have to experience the deep. For those of you that are pursuing it and that you're you're trying your best to live for God, the deep is a place that makes you vulnerable. Because you have no control in the deep. And the deep works twofold. 
God uses the deep as a place of development and the enemy uses the deep as an opportunity to destroy. When you consider the story of Job and the lesson we can learn from his life, while the enemy did all he could to destroy Job, God uses his situation to develop him. God takes what the enemy meant for evil and he uses it for good. But that doesn't mean that it's easy. Jesus called his disciples to the deep and the deep in this story is the thing that separates what is and what will be. It's important to know that what is encountered in the deep reveals who you really are. Because sometimes we have a tendency to believe we are better than we really are. Because we come to church, because we do this, because our parents have, have, have trained us in this, there's this idea that, that you can't be touched. Sometimes we think that because we go to church and have been raised in it all our lives, we're stronger than we really are. That's why God uses the deep as a place of revelation to expose what it is that we are and what we are not. The disciples probably thought they were invincible on the boat with Jesus, but that all changed when the storm came. When the clouds turned dark and the waves got rough and the boat began to take on water, they became fearful. They were in a bad situation and fearing for their lives. And Jesus was nowhere to be seen because he was asleep. And when you can't see God, it's common for people to question. Everybody in this room tonight, our adults especially, I know they have. They've lived for God long enough to know what it's like to experience a good storm. They know what it's like to experience tough times. I'm talking to some people tonight that have experienced a rough year. Unlike anybody else in the nation, we've taken a hit. It's been hard. You've had to persevere through some things. You've had to rough it out through some things. You've had to do some things you never had to do before. And it's been tough. And I've watched things happen to good people. And there's no, I can't make sense of it. Because how do people that are faithful to God, how are people that are true to God, that have dedicated their life to this, that have committed themselves for, to this, how can these things happen to good people? How is it that good people die? How is it that faithful people go back to destroyed homes? But when you've been called to the deep, when you're walking in the deep, there's going to be some things that don't add up that you can't understand. And the deep has storms. And storms come in different forms. There are physical storms, but there are spiritual ones too. And storms are powerful. And storms are unpredictable. And a storm is capable of causing you to question something you once believed in. The disciples were now in a situation that was out of control. And their emotions have gone crazy. Now they've questioned whether what they have been believing is true. Because they're going through this and Jesus is nowhere to be seen. He's asleep. And he's not doing anything about it. So they begin to question. There aren't many of us in here that haven't questioned God. There's been people that have said, I'm not sure I should be believing in this anymore. Because for me to have put in the effort, for me to have been as dedicated as I've been, for me to have committed to this the way that I have, and experienced what I've experienced, I'm not sure this is true. Because what I've heard preached on Sunday doesn't match up with what I experienced on Monday. I know the Word says that you care. Sometimes it sure doesn't feel like he does. So people question God. And they ask themselves, so what, have I, what I've heard about you and what I'm experiencing are two different things. And I'm not sure that this is real. The scripture says that Jesus was asleep. So they go to him and they wake him to ask, don't you care? Do you not see what's happening to us right now? We're about to sink and all you can do is sleep. How can you do that when we're going through this? Where were you? I've made the decision to follow you and this is what happens. When I committed to you when I was standing on the bank, if I knew this is how it was going to be, I would have stayed. I've pursued you. I've gone to church. I've lived by your word. 
I've devoted myself to a life of holiness even when it wasn't popular. When my friends did what they wanted, I stepped away from the crowd and I walked this road alone thinking you had me. Do you not care about my pain? Do you not care about my loneliness? Do you not care about my depression? I'm struggling and I don't know that I can make it. Do you even care? It's in this moment of confliction that you question, is all this even worth it? And I'm speaking to some young people tonight that have had to go through some things that young people shouldn't have to go through. That generations of old shouldn't have been exposed, that generations of old weren't exposed to. You guys have had to go through some things, tough things, and you've had to live this truth and to pursue even through the bad times and to keep the faith. And when you're young and you haven't seen God do things for you, particularly like in your own life as an individual, I fear that I'm talking to young people that have a wounded faith. And the enemy wants you to have a wounded faith. Because if he can make you question what it is that you believe to be true now, he has a better chance of convincing you that the world's got something better. And I'm talking to people tonight that have gone through tough times, not just the young people. You guys have had to go through it too. It's been hard. And it hasn't made sense. And it's a tragedy, but I've watched people fall away that were called of God when the times got tough. People I would have never thought walk away from this truth walked away. Young people with all the potential in the world had to favor a God on them in such a way. There was greatness in them. But when it got tough, they decided it wasn't worth it all. Because they allowed what they felt to override what they knew. In verse 38, Jesus, uh, the disciples are in a state of panic and frustration and they ask Jesus, do you not care that we are about to die? And it says that Jesus arose and rebuked the wind and said unto the wind, peace be still. And everything was calm. Just like that. And he said to them, why are you afraid? Do you still have no faith? The disciples could only respond by the way they felt in the moment. And Jesus responded by what he knew. And when they came in there and they shook him violently and, and, and woke him up and were in a panic and they were questioning him and asking him, how could you do this to us? I can see him just walking to the front of the boat and saying, peace be still. And the disciples just get silent. For Jesus to ask them, where is your faith? Did the storm cause you to forget what I told you? The day that I called you to become fishers of men was the day that I chose you. And when I choose you, I'm committed to you. When I said, let us pass to the other side, I didn't say you would go alone. I was on the boat the whole time and I didn't take you this far to leave you here. I just needed you to learn some things in the storm that only a storm could teach you. And there's some of you here tonight that I know are going through some tough times. There's some young people here tonight that have legitimate struggles. You have legitimate problems and you're questioning and you found yourself in a place where you're trying to figure out why this is happening to you. But can I tell you that when you pursue God and you try the hard, like, to do things the right way and you're doing your hardest to commit to it, that there's going to be times that the storm comes. But don't you ever question the fact that Jesus has left you. Jesus will never leave you nor forsake you. He'll never be absent in your time of trouble. He's there and he hears you when you call. He's there and he hears you whenever you look up to him and you say, God, where are you? It's not that he can't hear you. It's just that the deep has to teach you some things that only you can learn in the deep. When the times get tough and the world goes dark, you've got to trust his word. In the moments it seems as if he's nowhere to be found, reflect back on the times where he showed you who he called you to be. Reflect back on those times that God came and visited you in a place of prayer and spoke to you and said, I'm calling you. Because whenever he did that, he's not going to go back on it. His word is true. And when he commits to you, he doesn't go back and change his mind. He stays true to it. And he trusts in you. And as long as you pursue him, he won't give up on you. In the moments it seems as if he's nowhere to be found. 
You have to be able to rely on his word. Understand that your life has an expected end. Before you were ever put here, he had a plan for you. And he's trying to teach this generation. I believe more now than ever. There's been a wait and there's been things that you've had to go through so that he could prepare you for where it is he's trying to take you. Because it's going to be through you that you do things no one else has ever done before. It's going to be through you guys that I, blind eyes are open and deaf ears are unlocked and miracle signs and wonders are seen. It's going to be through you. So he has to be able to put you through a place to pull out that greatness. He's got to be able to put you in a place to pressure out the potential that's in you. He's got to be able to put you in a place where you learn to trust him when you can't see any other way out. When situations hopeless, you've got to be able to put your faith in him. Because the deep develops you for your destiny. It was through the pain that you're being primed for greatness. It's through the hurt that he's teaching you. It's through the brokenness that he teaches you how to deal with brokenness so that you can minister to the broken. It's through the loneliness that he teaches you how to deal with the loneliness so that you can be a help to the lonely. It's through the hurt that he gives you strength. Nothing that you go through in life is without reason. And it's amazing to me that the disciples could be so close to him and to know him in such a real way and still question But it was in the deep that disciples were developed. But he had to teach them something. When the storm came and the situation looked hopeless, Jesus allowed them to see the storm and experience it because they had to experience it before he intervened so that they would learn to trust what he said even when they couldn't see it. As you pursue the will of God, there will be times that you question, but you have to trust what he said, even when you couldn't see. You have to trust the fact that you're chosen. You have to trust the fact that you've been called. You have to be, trust the fact that you were put here for this time, in this hour, to make a difference in this world. Don't allow the bad things that happen in your life to deter you from where it is that you're trying to take you. The enemy will use your past to affect your present in hopes to deter you from your future. And you have to rebuke that and you have to say, no, I know what it is that God called me to be. I know why I'm here. I know what it is that he's put me here to do. And I've got to pursue with everything that I have and not go back on what I know he told me. The deep develops you for your destiny. It was amusing to me that not long after their storm experience, the disciples found themselves in a nearly identical situation. They were in a storm again and they were afraid. But what gets me is that it says Jesus went out to meet them in the midst of the storm and they didn't recognize him. And as he's walking across the water, he says, it is I, be not afraid. And Peter still didn't believe him. So he says, Lord, if it's really you, Call me by name to meet you on the water. To which Jesus responded, come. It was in the deep the disciples were invited by Jesus to come. He didn't call Peter by name individually. He said, come, which tells me that was an open invitation to whoever wanted to experience something no one else had ever done before. Peter was just the only one that walked. Everybody wants to get on Peter for falling but at least he tried. Don't ever let it be that I have an opportunity to experience greatness, but I allow the fear of my situation to hold me back from it. I want it to be that whenever this, this church, whenever God calls Westlake to greatness, that I got a squad with me. I want it to be that whenever he says, come, that every one of you, y'all y'all competing to get off the boat first. I want to see you guys get up, and I want it to be that you got this block, and you got this block, and I'm going to go here, and I'm going to do, and I'm going to pursue. And I want it to be that through us, we make a difference for our world and pursue him to do something great that the world has never seen before. Stand with me tonight as our singers come. I don't know what it is 
that you guys have gone through, but I know what I felt whenever I started studying for this message. And I know that there's been people in here that have questioned why things have happened. And I can't tell you why. I don't understand, but if you can just trust what he says, even when you can't see it. He doesn't forget about you. I could take you to a place in my life where I, at 23 years old, found myself in an emergency room. Not knowing if I was going to live, I was in there with heart, chest pains, and I, I couldn't breathe and I couldn't catch my breath. And I sat there and I wondered, why is this happening? God, for me to do what I've done and for me to commit to you the way that I have, this isn't how I envisioned it. The nurse came in and they didn't know what was going on. They didn't know what was happening with me. Said, your kidneys are struggling. Your heart's under pressure. We don't know what's going on. But I could tell it was serious. I didn't know if God was about to take me in a heart attack in that moment. I didn't know and I was sitting there and I was talking to him. No one else could be in there with me. I was in there alone, isolated, wondering why, questioning why me, when I've done all this and I've tried to do everything right, why me, 23 years old, and I'm just trying to do what you've called me to do. But it was in that moment of weakness I remembered who it was that he called me to be. It was in that moment it was that he hit me with a wake-up call and he said, I didn't take you this far to leave you. I just have to teach you some things. And there's some of you in here tonight, you've had that moment. You're at that crossroad where you're trying to decide if this is what you want to do. But because things have looked bad and you don't understand why, You've gone through bad situations. You question it. It's worth even pursuing anymore. But can I tell you tonight that as long as you're still here, as long as you're still pursuing this truth, it is no accident that you're here. He called you specifically for this time and for this moment to make a difference in a world. I know I've said this before, but he called Paul to do what Paul needed to do. He called Peter to do what Peter needed to do. Elijah came and he did what he needed to do. But in the greatest hour, in the greatest moment, there's this sense of urgency. And God's getting ready to do something great and it's you that he's chosen. It's you that he has specifically called for this time and in this moment to do something the world's never seen before. So tonight I need you to understand that you're not here by accident. Everything's intentional and he's trying to call for you. He's trying to pull for some of you and he's trying to take you to a place you've never seen before. The disciples went on after they had made it through the storm and went on to the other side. The Bible says that they went over there and they preached and miracles were performed and they cast out many devils. But Jesus had to take them to a place so that they could learn who Jesus was and who they were. That way they could walk in the fulfillment of the calling he put on them. And right now, I feel like you're being primed and positioned to do just that. He's preparing you He's getting ready to take you to a place to elevate you, to do something great. He's trying to pull it out of you, and I believe that there's some of you tonight that feel that call. There's some of you tonight that feel it, so tonight, maybe he wants to, to confirm that in you. So I'm going to open these altars. If there's some of you in here tonight that feel like maybe that's you, maybe it is that God's trying to get something more out of you, but... You've, you've been struggling lately. Maybe there's been some things that you've fallen into. Maybe there's been some things that, that because of, of your lack of faith, you've gone back to some bad habits. But God's saying, I want you to know that I'm still here. I want you to know that I've still called you. Right now is your opportunity. I would ask us all to come to the front. 
and begin to pray. And maybe you just want to lift your hands and reconnect to Him and say, God, I'm still here. Still here to be used with you. Continue to reach out to Him. This is your moment. This is your opportunity to reconnect. This is your moment for you to get back to that place. This is your moment. Don't let it pass you by. If some of our adults would come and pray with these young people tonight, help us with this. I have.
back to the boat, it was a revelation of the love of God. Yeah, Jesus is there.